and then go, hey, everybody, how you doing? Uh, welcome back to Six of One. Uh, we're back on my channel this week, Robert's channel next Wednesday. Uh, and we are trying out our, what we believe is the, the correct continuity. Or <laughs> We've made our own continuity. Possibly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so this week we're following a rival uh, with what we both agreed with uh, was the second episode in, in the continuity, which was Dance of the Dead. Uh, so the first thing I've got to ask Robert is, instead of going to Chimes of Big Ben, which is the broadcast second episode, having watched Dance of the Dead, how did you feel this worked following Arrival? Well, I think that was the thing that I was most curious about is is how would I feel about it? And 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 just watching Arrival for our show, then coming back and doing this, I I thought this was brilliant because this episode is so intriguing and it expands the the questions that it poses to the viewer. Um are, are enormous and there's a lot of ramifications that happen this episode is chock-a-block full of of interesting plot developments mm. and and the stuff that the the village is trying there's like multiple multiple ways of 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 infiltrating number six's mind both literally and figuratively in this episode yeah. and i and i think that as a second episode if you're watching it in our order it really works well. And mm. you have a female number two. Straight away. Straight, straight away. away. After, after the first episode, you straighten with a female number two. And yeah. I forgot, you know, look, everyone loves Leo McKern as number two. Like, mm. it's, it's everyone's, he's everyone's favorite uh, number two, probably. But, but it even throws the viewer even more off kilter, especially, can you imagine during the 60s, like, number two is a woman? That was a big deal. And, and, and the fact that you know she's a little bit more ambiguous than our first number one that we met mm -hmm. in arrival uh, i it works i think it works beautifully to do it this way um i think one of the best things of course is mary morris who plays number two uh is sensational she's uh she's a graduate of rada uh royal academy of dramatic art so good i had a, I had a chance to go there once i never took it uh and um she's very she's tiny She's diminutive, uh, but she is her presence is huge, right? And uh, she, when she's in the scene with number two, it's definitely peers. You know, uh, there's there's this person is is she's so menacing, and at the same time, she has she's kind of almost like a mirror image of number six in as right. much as he has the kind of stern exterior and then has that little bit of. Uh, warmth behind him, which we see a couple of times in this episode. Um, maybe his guard was slipping because he was new. This is this is one thing that I kind of like about you can play with this episode. Yes, uh, as as it being the second in continuity wise, uh, and whereas the number two is very pleasant, but when she slips, very menacing indeed, uh, and well, quite macabre as well, really. Um, well, yeah, yeah, there's other great actors like Aubrey Morris, who plays the town crier. Yes. And in, in later on, in, in I guess the tribunal, what would you call that? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it was a tribunal. Tri so. Just something. He was in, he played Mr. Deltoid in A Clockwork Orange in 1971 for Stanley Kubrick. And, you know, I loved seeing uh, him. Well, too. my favorite film with Aubrey was Life Force, obviously. Uh, I love Life Force. I think Life Force is, uh, is oh, fantastic. I, I recently, you know, my girlfriend and I do this show called Whining About Movies on YouTube, mm. and she'd never seen Life Force, and we did Life Force. Yeah. And Aubrey Morris is great in Life Force. Yeah. By the way, for those keeping track at home, the first time Patrick Stewart ever had an on screen kiss yes. was in Life Force with Steve Railsback. With a man, yes. With a man. Uh, with a man <laughs> while he was possessed by a female vampire. Yes. Yes. Space Vampire, sorry. And uh, yeah, the international right. version, they released it. Scream Factory put it out because there's two different versions of Life Force. I know this is sort of a digression, but I really like the long version of Life Force. I think it's goofy fun. I probably think I've only seen the original. I don't think I've seen the long version, so maybe I should source you, it out. Well, you might have because the long version is the international version, so it might have been the one that was released in the UK. Okay, okay. 
Um, but yeah, I was watching Life Force when I was 16, 16, yeah. 17 years old. I know old. why you were. I know why. <laughs> well, I mean, God, what was she got? Matilda May. Matilda May. Woo! Perhaps, perhaps the greatest breasts I've ever seen. And they look I, un uh, unnatural. Yeah. And I mean, even now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, as a kid, uh, you've never seen breasts like hers. They are no. just. Uh, yes, it, we went straight from the prisoner to breasts, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Um, and even today, well, her name is still in my brain, you know, 30 years later. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, she made a, a big impression, a couple of big impressions. But up, but, but up, but. That's where we end that joke. But anyway, hey, look, it's British, and the prisoner is British. So there's your tenuous connection. Yes. Um, yeah, but life, yeah, life force, of course, with Patrick Stewart. I mean, Patrick Stewart, I think that might have been his first, was it his first on screen role? His no, first no, be role? because he was in Excalibur. Oh, it was Excalibur. Okay. Excalibur came out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I knew he was one of, I knew he was one of, the, he, so it was just his first on screen kiss. Yes. Right. <laughs> Which is so funny. I the best I know it's kind of devolved into uh, life force, but my my favorite thing um, is to at the end it kind of almost devolves into an episode of Keystone Cops <laughs> uh, when you've got the the oh yeah the agent running around the streets and the zombies coming from all angles. It's just like Keystone Cops. Uh, it's got a great ending. Um, so yes, uh, Dance the Dead. Uh, if we look at it from uh, episode two. Continuity wise, uh, we start off with uh, number six being <sighs> touchy feely in bed um, by this um, mad doctor. And again, one of the great things about this being in the second episode is if you listen to some of the lines that number six says in this episode, it feels as if it has just come straight from arrival. Right. I completely agree. And it, yeah, he's 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 newly arrived, and and another thing, the way it opens, it really shows just to what lengths they're tormenting him. Mm. You know, it's not just it, arrival seemed like it was all psychological, yeah, uh, but now it's like no, that's no, straight up experimentation. There's, yeah, uh, there's uh, mad doctors a lot of his rules. Brain. There right. are lots of kind of like rules which are which are laid out in this episode. Yeah. And uh, if you kind of take those into consideration throughout the rest of the series, then you realize they're not actually wrong here. They're, they're not wrong. They're right uh, with what they say. It's, it's one of those things that you can... I mean, for instance, uh, one of the things that uh, the number two says, Mary Morris says, which is quite menacing, is uh, we will... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We will indulge you. We'll indulge you for a while, but then we'll take what we want from you. Yeah. Um, and that's why uh, we see number six being uh very touchy-feely uh, to start with. But then when we get towards the latter episodes, uh, we're getting body swaps with him. <laughs> right. uh, we're getting uh, living in harmony where he's a freaking cowboy. Uh, we're getting potential lobotomization. Uh, you know, the, the, so they have, they truly do escalate uh, towards the end of the uh, towards the end of the the series. And there's also, a, I think, there's a linking element in this episode uh, to the body on the beach, which we'll get to uh, later on. Uh, so the, uh, the 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 mad doctor this week uh, infiltrates uh, number six's home while he's asleep, uh, puts some kind of contraption on him. And he, uh, do you he, think he's number forty? Do mm. you think there's any significance? I mean, I, 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 I've always wondered. Like, I've always like wanted to dig back in mythology. Do the numbers of these people have something analogous in either literature, or do you think that the Ooh. the numbers they choose for these people have a, a deeper meaning? I, I'm sure at one point I thought the same, but uh, little Bo Peep, uh, she's two hundred and forty. Uh, or two, is it 260, actually? I think she's maybe yeah. 260. So as as kind of like, how do you... And I think, I thought, 260, number six. I think this is saying that there's a lot more here. There's a lot more people here. Right. A lot more going on here than, than meets the eye. Because if you were to look at the village and get everybody congregated together, 
you might get 100, 120 people together. But when you're looking at number 260, I mean, superficially on the, ex, you know, on the external. Yeah, uh, when I mean, you're getting uh, 260 people, it means people on different levels. Yeah, that's what I thought. But there's, going. there's, I always thought that there's, and I think this episode reinforces the fact that there's a lot more of the village than we ever even see uh, underground, mm. sprawling. Uh, that it, it, it like it wouldn't surprise me that <laughs> that like the Krell Lab in Forbidden Planet that stretches like fifty miles. You know, if you've ever seen the 1957 film Forbidden Planet, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's unbelievable. Like, I wouldn't wouldn't surprise me that that there th- there's something along those lines underneath the village. Like, yeah, I, I that I, it I extends was, uh, for miles. Yeah, you know? the, the the first Resident Evil movie. I always kind of viewed that as sort of the village, right? Uh, in as much right. as you see. The sprawling tunnels, when you get the map, you see the sprawling tunnels and how deep it goes. And that's kind of how I was always envisaged the village beneath. Yes. Uh, you know, what you see, because I think it goes along with the themes of the the series as well. Because the the Hollywood, you know, the, the sorry, the holiday village scene is very superficial. Yes. And it's very superficial to the, the horrendous things which are, happening and again we find out some of these horrendous things that happen in the village uh who's disposable who isn't disposable um what is disposable right as well have you outlived uh, your usefulness do we yeah e- even even like you know we'll take it from you and if we know everything well we'll we'll dispense with your services yeah, however but that's going which to be way done. do you do it because i think i think the again i think the episode purposely showed two different ways yeah uh this 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 episode so he the doctor plays the wants to play the the, the psychological trick on him yeah uh, he puts this contraption on number six it it's he explains to the handler next to him that it has worked on other people the supervised this week's supervised i should really say right uh that it, this has worked on other people um and uh he he has a person next to him which is uh walter dutton Yep, and uh, he—it was almost as if uh, this this device takes him back to where he when he's working. It sort of blocks out the village. It blocks out his resignation. It takes him back to a position where he thinks he's working, and then and then Dutton is feeding him lines through the phone to try and get him to reveal uh, the information. And as I mentioned, I think uh, last week when we were discussing arrival. I believe that the the resignation was the was only the the opening question to to break him to get everything else. Sure. And this was and this guy was asking that he was like, I need you know, we, oh we we think we've been compromised. We need you to you know spill the beans on all the information that you were looking at, all the you know cases and da da da, um, which would have revealed all the secrets. Uh, and he was just like, you you can't ask me that even sedated even drugged even mind controlled whatever whatever you want to put it as uh he would refuse uh to give it up and that's when number two comes in and tells him to put an end to it because this guy is a little bit different than the others and i also like though that that in a way hypn- hypnotizing somebody had become such a trope by this mm. time even even back when the series was made You know, you had movies like The Manchurian Candidate, which had a very long and protracted hypnosis sequence. And and the idea in very spy shows or James Bond. So they by putting Dance of the Dead in our little order, we get rid of this trope right away. You know, the idea that he's being they're trying to break him. And even number two comes in and says, no, 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 no. This isn't going to work. This isn't going to work on him. I'm going to put an end to this. (laughs) You know, and it's in a way they're, they're saying like, yeah, we're smarter than you, the viewer. We know you were thinking about this, but now watching in this particular order, all of that, that whole trope is immediately dispensed with, which yes. was something that it hit me at watching it again, going, well, it's great you watch it this way, so we don't have to deal with this thing anymore, this 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 hypnosis thing, which it could have worked maybe, but then you find out not on number six, it's not. Well, so, no, uh, A, B, and C. When we get to A, B, and C, that takes it a little bit further. Well, yes, it goes, but, but, but because it's set up, you know, hmm. it's, oh it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then uh, when you see it in this order, it kind of it's the escalation. That yes, we, it we, is, we, and yeah. that's what I loved. I mean, it, it it's funny because that it really it made for me it made 
like the chimes of Big Ben as number two always bothered me because it, it tips the hand of 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 what can happen way too early. And once you've watched the chimes of Big Ben, I feel other episodes are actually compromised. And yeah, because you're always guarded. You're very, yeah. very guarded about the people who come in and who he's speaking to. And Absolutely. And by doing this, there's so much going on in this episode, so many different things happening, so many different kinds of manipulation, maybe. And yeah. there's just so many intriguing elements about the village, about it sets up many, many more questions in the viewer's mind than the Chimes of Big Ben does, mm. I, I, especially about the village and who's in control and what are they doing here and how much power do, do they actually have? And I, I feel that is much, much better uh, as you move forward through the series by watching this episode now. Yes. Um, and then when he wakes up, to me, it feels like we're back in Arrival. Uh, right, because new, he doesn't remember maid, anything. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't remember anything. A new maid comes into the house and she's trying to be all happy and smiles. And then he just says, you know, he's very guarded now. He's just like, the maids come and the maids go. Go, oh, right. Uh, you know, he, he, you know, he's sort of like, I know the, who the maids are. The maids are part of the village and they are part of the supervising team and they're here to spy. And they're, know, just, they're here it, to it, clean up. You know, they're looking, they're searching. And they're it's doing almost, all of the things. Sometimes they'll dangle, like the maids can be used in many different ways, depending on like wh whatever they want to do. They could be younger, they could be older, they could be all kinds of things, but they're always going to throw him off somehow because they're yeah. like the, the first, they're the first line of, of offense for the village. Every well, morning. Uh, next week when we do free for all, that will be explored even further. Yeah. Um, and again, once you put the context of free for all into this, it opens up some very interesting, I think, some really interesting things. Uh, very, pro and I would say, very progressive. Yeah. Um, in a in a natural way that feels how it should be. Um, and so, yeah, this maid is different. The first maid that we had played the heartstrings. She played the sympathy card. Oh, they said if you would give me some information, then yeah. They would let me go. And he's just like, let me get right on that, honey. Yeah. 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 I won't be sure. needing your services today. <laughs> and he won't feel, he won't fall for that sort of manipulation. This maid is a little bit sterner, but a bit nonplus at the same time. Right. Uh, she's not in, she's not looking to flirt, flirt with him. She's not trying to seduce him. Uh, I think she's working purely in uh, tandem with his handler which we'll see uh, a little bit uh, later on in the episode. Uh, but this is uh, an introduction to number two, because number two literally just pops on the TV. So, like, good morning. And then he's just like, yeah, all right, hi. We've got another number two, have we now? Which I also thought in the show is a very, the number, there's really a revolving door of number twos. Mm. And the number twos, for as, as capable as they always seem to be, and with all the different techniques they use against him, they seem to be quite disposable to whoever is running the village. Uh, I, I, and I always thought that was very intriguing that somebody who's in that much, in a position of that much power, isn't being given a whole lot of time to succeed in this task in breaking number six or whatever they're doing. I mean, and I, I always found that to be very interesting that well mm. the number two the, these people are supposed to be running this village or are they really is the whole position of number two like they they always show the number twos in power and giving orders and everything but but i always felt like now they're very transitory and fleeting so they don't really seem to be in charge because they're not in charge for very long and um, that always, I, uh, my theory on number two was uh number two is not necessarily here for number six uh, some of them very much so are, right. are there to try and break number six. But I always had the feeling that certain number twos were there for certain reasons and having a punt, you know, sort of while you're there, see what you can do with this number six guy. Right. You know, but they, but they had other, they had other things that they wanted to do. I mean, even in the first episode, um, we get thrown a little bit of a curveball. Superficially, you can say, oh, no, they were trying to break number six. But it's quite clear that they were actually trying to entrap the girl. 
Uh, and so, you know, when you really look into it, they wanted to, to, to trap her to see exactly where her loyalties lie. Did she fall in love with Cobb? And that's why she was compromised. Or is she as a person compromised in the village? And she's right. trying to, to work against the village. And then when number six arrives, they use her to play against number six. And then they realize, oh no, she's actually out to, to subvert the village now. So time to get rid of her. <laughs> uh, you'll never see her again. Um, so, so number six kind of came, even though it was he, from his perspective, from his narrative, the number two was there for because both of those were, were pretty mm -hmm. much there for 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 a different reason. I always found thought that this number two was as well. I always felt as if uh, she kind of just popped up because she was busy doing other stuff, and then uh, this number two, for example, uh, number six, sorry, was kind of there as well, and they thought they might have a little bit of a. Yeah, Let's take have a play a, take, with him. Yeah, take take a run at him. See what you can do. Yeah, because she's she's clearly got a relationship with the doctor. You know, they do know each other. I mean, there's the, the part where he meets her in the corridor, and they just have this this off the cuff conversation. He's just like the other night when I tried to break number six. Did you put that in the report to number one? And she's like, I left it out. It's like, oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, also maybe the number twos are are they are these operatives that are just that their job is to swing through different places. They're almost like fixers that come mm. in like a mafia fixer, except they work for whomever, and that's their job is they're constantly rotating through. So the 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 number two, the the whole play, the whole job of number two is not to stay at the village. It's known you're in there and you're out of there. That's part of the whole the whole thing. Or is it's it, it, there are there are episodes where you think okay these number twos if they fail at their run at number six they're gone like yes they're 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 disposed of yes there, there's very confident number twos and then it's very worrisome number twos yes um and and I did like that some num like for instance I see this number two at the end of this episode going on to other stuff right uh, both number twos from the first episode I see going off doing other stuff. Uh, the number two in A, B, and C, which comes back for Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, um, you kind of feel as if uh, Seltzman was his final chance. Right. <laughs> and he's now never to be seen again. Uh, when we see It's Your Funeral, uh, we get to see what happens to a potentially retiring number two. Yes, we do. <laughs> so, so yeah, the, uh, but Leo McKern, I mean, Leo McKern was kind of, you thought as if his number two was was very much well thought of. Uh, and he wasn't given the time, enough time with the um, Chimes of Big Ben. And so that's why they bring him back for this this breaking in uh, Once Upon a Time, uh, which then leads into Fallout, which is actually filmed almost a year after Once Upon a Time. Hence why Leo McKern goes through such a drastic change in Fallout. Uh, but you, you you think you know they clearly feel highly of this. So the 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 number two is sometimes just as much the prisoner as the number six or anyone right. in the village. Right. Yeah. And I I always kind of felt that, and and it, it was always interesting to sort of in my mind juxtapose the plight of number two because we always saw in terms of how number two reacted to number six, but. You you always did get a sense that whatever was going on, there was there was more stuff, there was more stuff going on in number two's life than we would ever know, and that was always yeah. part of the the intriguing notion. We would never know what's going on. We would never know where two came from before he was in the village or where they went after the village. And like you said, the relationship that she has with the subordinates um, in this episode, like Dutton, they clearly know each other. They've worked together, and they've worked together. It's not like they just met. They've worked together for a while. Like oh, they're yeah. They're yeah, he operative. calls him friend. He does call him friend. And, um, and it's it's very interesting to see. And mm. then there's a cat. <laughs> there's a cat. Yeah, there's a cat which keeps popping up, um, which number six plays, uh, takes a fancy to, uh, brings him into the cottage. The maid is not happy with the cat in the cottage. No. But then we get what is such a simple line and i fucking love it uh where he's given the cat some milk or some cream or something 
And then he just says to the maid, he says, where's it come from? The milk, the potatoes, the cream, the carrots. Where does it arrive when we're at night, when we're asleep? You know, and he's just, he's, and she just like, just walks out, giving him a look. She doesn't, you know, she's, she's not phased by him. She's heard this by plenty of people before. But it's uh, a great, out. it's a great question yeah. to ask. You know, and and again, the the idea of what is the supply chain into this place? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like you see semi truck show up at a grocery store and unload what they need, and and the idea of where does this equipment come from, and and where does where does it all go, and and uh, it, it's it these are very important world building questions. Yes, uh, that that they're working into the plot. I mean, they don't. It's it's very ingenious how they address these things. You know, rather than seeing them, you the fact that that number six is asking these questions, they're in his mind. You know, we get to know what he's thinking about. Um, and it's because he's thinking at the time, well, if there's a supply chain, maybe I can escape using the supply chain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and it's it's insinuated by the, the question itself. You know, his mind is working. You think, oh, is there going to be the, the great vegetable escape from the yeah, village? Yeah, he, he's, that... he's trying to put cogs into the machine and, and right. get the, the wheels to fully turn. And at the if, same if time, this the viewers. Here, this comes in here. Yeah. Yeah. The viewers do too, because it's something you don't think about. You're not thinking about, but they're like, oh, so the writers have addressed, like nowadays, you'd have fans asking these kinds of questions online. You know, they like, well, always well, seem to have yeah, food they... and vegetables <laughs> in every episode. If this is an isolated island where nobody can attend them, where's the farms? <laughs> you yes. know. Um, but but I think that was a, an interesting way of dealing with all of that, and, because then you don't ask that question anymore. You're like, well, no, they get it in somehow. They it comes in, and you don't know. You don't know. Uh, but we we do see the helicopter. You know, in the early stages and early episodes, we do see the helicopter coming and going, normally just dropping off people. Uh, but the helicopter is is kind of that link to the outside, which you know. So maybe I won't mean I couldn't imagine that helicopter bringing anything in. But what I'm trying to say is there's definitely a link and a supply to this village. Yes. Uh, so there's a network to this village. Where that network is, sometimes the best answer is never to answer it. But right. the question was great to, yeah. to see where, so where did this stuff come from. Um, and so we uh he where do we go from there? He goes to um well, number two, n number two suggests tells him, you know, you should get a girlfriend. Oh, that's it. Yeah, he. Well, he. Yeah, he goes outside, and then number two uh, speaks to him. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have the festival. Of course, there's the, the, right. the festival, the carnival is happening. Um. So you should you should you know settle down here, number two. And it's like, nah. And then she takes them to three women. They're all young, you know. They're they're unattached. Uh, you know, you could settle down with one of these people, and then he looks across to little Bo Peep. Uh, well, who's going to be little Bo Peep? Who uh, actually is going to turn out to be his handler? That's uh, Norma West, who's uh, still with us today. A uh, very attractive woman as well. Uh, Norma, well, mm, yes, please. And uh, he points to her, and um, number two is just like, no. No, she's not for you. And he's like, I'm independent, remember? <laughs> They're trying to quell that independent streak. So he sits down with, uh, or tries to sit down uh, with this 200, number 260, Yeah, I think. And, 240, uh, 240. 240. 240. It was 240. I did get it right the first time. There you go. But uh, she's like, I've got to go. And he's, and he's like, please don't. And then, she, he, then he kind of softens a little bit. Yeah. He's like, don't don't mind me. I'm, you know, he's because he doesn't know yet who he doesn't understand the structure of the village yet. So he doesn't understand who are the who are the prisoners and who are the warders. Uh, you and, know, and neither neither on. does neither neither do we as the viewer. And no. and every time we're meeting, whether it's an observer, whether it's a cat, you know, roaming around, we're we're learning again, it's all world building. You know, and we're seeing more of 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 the village reveal itself, and and again, they're playing on tropes of things that we as viewers like. They're subverting things, whether it's like you said, Bo Peep, the idea of a carnival. I mean, all of this stuff is sort of incongruous with being a spy. You know, it's and it's I, mm. I and yet 
yet there's a fairy tale quality to all of it. The through the looking glass, Alice in Wonderland. I, I mean, the village itself looks like it's from some storybook. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and so the, the ideas of fictions within fictions within fictions are, mm. are, are constantly layered throughout these episodes, which I always love. And then we get the classic, what we saw in the first episode, where he st tries to push her, and then she's just like, questions are a burden to an uh, others. Answers a prison to oneself. Oh, so good. And then every time he tries to ask a question, she kind of defaults to an essential name rank serial number. Right. Um. Uh, so so he's just like, yeah, 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 okay. And then she's like, I, I, I gotta go. So at that time, you don't know who she is. No. You don't know if she's a, a prisoner. Uh, you don't know if she's worried that he's part of the, the you know, he's a warder. Uh, and she's, it's her herself who is guarded <clears throat> and then she vanishes um is that when we get uh aubrey come on to the gantry to uh proclaim the I, the, the carnival i think that's a little later yeah it could be a little later on uh but we then see bo peep in the supervisor we see her in the supervisor's uh room and she is keeping a tab on Number six, she's right. his handler. She's her what? His watcher. Yeah, I think they call it. And it's essentially handler. observer. Observer. Yeah, she's yeah. she's watching every move that he makes, uh, and he as yet doesn't know that he he won't know that. And then we get what I think is uh, just one of the great. I think just one of the greatest scenes in the in the whole series, the whole show, where he tries to sleep. Well, he doesn't want to sleep. He tries to sit down, and and the 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 room is doing everything it can to make him sleep. <laughs> Everywhere he sits, everything he does, something turns on. Something tries to hypnotize him. Something tries to soothe him, and he's just like, "Bugger this!" He can't leave the house because the door's locked. Uh, but he jumps out the window, which isn't, which was actually filmed at night in Port Marin. Yeah, I mean, this is from a, a production standpoint. Mm. This episode began by fil being filmed at Port Marion, and then later on, they went and finished it off at MGM. And I'd read yes. that I'd read that um, uh, that there was like three episodes that weren't they hadn't edited them. And I want to say Living in Harmony was one, uh, but then this they thought this was the editors thought this was the best of the episodes, so they put this together first. I mean, I don't know. Well, what that I, means. Think, I think I think it went there, but uh, there is a there is a point where it's outside his cottage, and it's clearly at the NGM studio. Yeah, where, with with a you know painting of the uh, thing oh, yeah. behind him. Yeah, <laughs> but he uh, he he opens the window, jumps out the window, uh, goes down to the beach. Uh, number two is watching him. You know, uh, she hits uh, orange alert for Rover to pop up. And then he's just like running along the beach, and Rover is just mirroring his movements, which I, and I, I lo love, love it. I love it too. It's it's love it. You know, it's amazing to me how effective that could have been. Such a stupid thing, and we talked about it in I, I think our introductory episode mm. that they were going to use like this mechanical go kart was going to be the Rover instead. But the idea, the idea that even something as simple as well, basically a giant inflatable beach ball can yeah. be can be so menacing just by the way it moves. What is it? Is it uh, were they I, were they symbolizing? Is it Newton's law of resistance or Matt, where an equal and opposite reaction is you know met with a because that's essentially what it was. Yeah, it, his, his reaction was met with an equal uh, reaction. Yeah, you know, there's uh, a there's an episode of a, a third season episode of Star Trek in 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 '69 called The Empath, which which is not a great episode. It's really weird because it's all theatrical and it, mm. it takes, and the the Vians are torturing this woman, Gem, to find out. Well, there's a great there's a, a force field in that episode, and they finally realize that the more they resist against the force field, the stronger the force field becomes. Yeah. And I, I, because I literally watched that Star Trek episode last week um, with my girlfriend, and that th th it reminded me of that. Like when he's mm. he's mimicking like the rover, like the, the if he started moving really fast, the rover would have just got stronger and stronger and stronger. Yes, yeah. You know, uh, and, if, he, and, if he went to attack it, it would have attacked him. Yes, it, it, it would have responded in kind. And it, it's so great because 
it's 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 such a simple image, but it becomes so um, menacing, you know, mm. because and, and the way they the way they showed you in the first episode what happens when it it, it stretches over your face. So the rover will will smother you to death. I mean, it can yes. do that. And yeah. it, it is I, I every time I see it. I, I, maybe it's because when I was a kid, I, I it scared me, you know. I sort of, but it's great. I mean, I love this scene when when you see Rover because it shows that it has different capabilities, mm -hmm. and it can. And you wonder what else can it do? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think well, you have this incredible line by number two, and she just says, "He'll go home." It's the only place he can go to. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, it's like, wow. It's just like, this this guy's fucked. You know, it's just so good. So and good she, but she, that. too, that line coming from her, like, she knows what's up. <laughs> oh, yeah. She knows. It's great. But and it makes her... is, he doesn't. He doesn't even go home. He just falls asleep on the beach. Um, And then when he wakes up, he sees the shore, and there's a dead body on the shore. As there is, in the village. which is, uh, yeah, as there is in the village, uh, relatively looks kind of the similar age to number six, kind of the same color hair as number six, um, physicality approximately the same. So, kind of the same. He look, he rifles through the, the body, finds a radio, a uh, little, little handheld radio and a wallet with uh, information about the person. Yep. And there's a there's a cave just nearby. So he drags the body from the beach into this cave um, and then goes back home. The maid's there. Surprise, surprise. Um, and uh, she, she says, oh, your costume's arrived for the, for the carnival. And uh, he realizes it's his tuxedo, his right. his personal tuxedo from back in London, and he's just, and uh, she says, "Ooh, lucky you!" And he's just like, "Well, maybe it means I'm still myself uh, instead of home to." And I think the the carnival is, I mean, when, I think that's the point time that we get um, uh, Aubrey Morris on the balcony proclaiming. Right. And uh, again, another great image is uh, you hear all the fanfare, the music, the cheering, but you see the faces. Nobody is, there's no emotion. There's no emotion on anyone's faces. Nobody's cheering. Nobody's smiling. Nobody's happy. Everyone is just miserable. Uh, and that kind of said a lot as well. Everything, again, is superficial. This whole thing is theatrical. Well, did we talk about, does he go and li does he? Go up and hear what's the radio broadcast. Well, it, yeah, when he's in his home, then he 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 kind of gets the radio out, and then we see that they know he's got the radio, right? Because the broadcast he hears, the mysterious mm. broadcast, is I love, I love the weird broadcast and the things that that is said. Um, um, you know, nowhere is there more beauty than here tonight. When the moon rises, the whole world will turn to silver. Do you mm. understand? It is important that you understand. I have a message for you. You must listen. The appointment cannot be fulfilled. Other things might be done tonight. If our torment is to end, if liberty is to be restored, we must grasp the nettle. Even though it makes our hands bleed, only through pain can tomorrow be assured. I love that. It's all weird as hell. Uh, yeah. And, and it, Who's you know, saying it? Where are they saying it? Yeah. And, and clearly this is some direct message. And, and was it sent because number six now has the radio and they know? Was it sent to the dead guy? And what I love about this is, first of all, it's creepy. And mm. they have used, like, even in shows like Lost, the the interest the broadcasts they get to the thing. Uh, this this I feel like this trope, the mysterious broadcast, has been used a hundred thousand times since then. And it's very, it's a very effective trope because look, it could be all gobbledygook, but for the viewer, you're going, what does it all mean? Well, I do have a theory. Oh, uh, later on in the episode, uh, when the little Bo Peep, uh, uh, Norm Morris cannot find number six, she says to the supervisor, uh, should I just start looking at number 34? So, She's not just his handler. She's the observer of multiple different people. Sure. 
And then they just very casually respond, oh, no, number 34 is dead. Right. <laughs> and she's like, how? It's not for us to ask. It's not for us to ask. And I think the dead body is number 34. Yeah. Uh, I think the dead body on the beach is number 34. I think they were killed uh, specifically uh, to be a plant for number six. I think if we'd seen the scene further after Rover, we'd see that number two realizes he doesn't go home. You know, he stays on the beach. They might have had this whole thing planned anyway. Uh, and I think that that message could possibly almost be number 34's um, whether or not he was complicit, but you know, he, he's sort of his end almost. But that's interesting. Do you really think they would straight up murder a dude just to plant just for a plant uh, uh, for number six or, or was yeah. he, he, was he killed for some other reason and they just figured, Oh, we'll maximize our, our ability. We'll maximize our, resources and since we have his dead body because we mm. see we see it later you know they obviously can they they have they recover dead bodies and yeah. they just they just decided to to take lemons and make lemonade and use the body because number two is resourceful and said yeah why don't we do this well he could have been um a victim of the doctor yeah exactly I mean, that, that, that doctor is clearly going through people right uh later in the episode just one of these uh, a lady very casually says, oh, I've got a kill order for number two, as if it's just everyday administration. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got a kill order for number two. I'll I'll make sure I give it to her. Well, another Which, thing uh, that's be Roland Walter Dutton. Yeah, I, I, another thing I liked about the fact that these bodies turn up on the beach or whatever is, I mean, whether he washed up on the beach there or presumably he was taken on, on the beach, it, it shows that and I think this is important because it ups the jeopardy of the whole village. I mean, before, if you're just being probed, they want to keep you alive. But this is like, nope, people are disposable here. You know, you. Well, I think you, the, the Dutton thing at the end certainly shows that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, um, yeah, you, you got to be, you better get worried because your time is limited. And I think that's a, that's a really, as far as the, it shows that there is an escalation here. There is mortal number six is in mortal jeopardy. And, mm. and that's something you didn't necessarily get from arrival. Yeah. And they, they play with that theme later on. Uh, literally, they, they literally play with that theme. And then we get this kind of the psychological answer to it. Um, so, so we we have the body. He he doesn't appears at the cave. Uh, he goes into the cave when he realizes it's Walter Dutton. Um, Dutton says that uh, you know how you doing? How's London? Same. Yeah. And then uh, Dutton, what is clever with uh, Roland Walter Dutton is is you are immediately told that this is a good guy. This is a good guy. This isn't a manipulation by the village. Uh, this guy's not a villain. He's not playing both sides. This is a good man. And because he immediately says to number six, I've uh, I've told them everything. Yeah, I mean, I've he's told a, them, I've he, told them everything. He, on that. He's 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 broken. They've yeah, or, or at least he appears that way. You know, he's he's a broken man, and and he you're seeing like this could be this number six is seeing what could be his future. Mm. He he could wind up this way, and he's like, I, I told them everything. You know that I wasn't privy to the the important stuff, which number six clearly was. Yep. But I've told them everything I know, and the irony is, they don't believe me. So uh, my time is is limited, uh, and so they've given me seventy two hours to think about it. You know. When he can't because he's given them everything he's got, and then they're gonna they're gonna kill me. They're gonna you know it. Well, we took we learned the term kill in this in the you know in the, in this instance, but they're gonna yeah. kill essentially kill him. And uh, it's quite you know it's kind of sad because um, he doesn't have anything that he can barter with. You know he's got no cards. He's right. shown all his cards. Number six is. He knows he's got a full hand and he's not giving anything away, but he sees what will happen if he he lets go of one of those cards. If he no, shows yeah, just he, one of those cards, he can't. 
And do you think, like, you know, Dutton personality wise seems to be, I mean, number six is very distant and aloof, an aloof guy, you know, and, and it seems like, like everybody else that is sort of in his circle is just nicer, maybe. And, and you get the idea. Do you think that, I mean, they're kind of defining number six's personality here that he seems a little bit maybe more ruthless. I mean, his, hmm. he's a, he's, he's a, he's a, a ruthless guy. And I think that, that he's not, I mean, maybe he was even, if, I mean, I don't, John Drake, there's no double O status, but I always thought that number six, he, if he had to, he wouldn't hesitate to kill it, kill somebody. Um, well, I, th I, I mean, I said last, uh, last week or the week before I said that number six is not a classic likable character. No, he is not. In as, in as much as he doesn't exude those, uh, that kind of, you know, bullshit personality or, or anything like that. Uh, this is a very matter of fact person that is is desperate to hold on to his individuality. Yes. Um, but due to the circumstances that he's in and what he's up against, we always root for him. A hundred percent. But he's I mean, not per se a likable character. No. Yeah, and he's I, probably the kind of person you'd meet in his and he'd be like, he's a bit of, he's a bit of a Now, I, I always kind of thought that there is a message in that. And and especially like like, and this is go with me on this. It's a little, it's a mm. little uh, so nowadays, today, we are in in such a tribal world, and everybody, you've got to join my team and believe what I believe, and and all of this. And if you don't, well then you're canceled or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. I thought it was a very interesting choice because even though number six is not a likable guy, perhaps we, as the audience that believe in a free society, we believe in freedom of speech. I believe in the sovereignty of the individual. The fact that you're rooting for a guy that's not particularly likable is exactly the kind of thing that we should be doing you know, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. And and nowadays, I think we live in a world where people would be very quick to get rid of those they disagree with rather than protect their individuality. Mm, and uh, here, which is explored in a change of mind. Yes. And and so now we have a character that we're still rooting for because we believe in protecting our individuality as well. Yeah. We, we, the yeah, audience it, does. And 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 yet, even though you don't like him, uh, it, our desire to see his individuality and his, the sanctity of his mind protected keeps us on his side. Now, it's, I wonder what he believes in that that makes us root for him. It's it's his principles. It's his morality. Do you think um, audiences of today though would be as accepting of that? Like, if you if you have never watched this show before, I would be very curious to see. Like, let's say you're in your mid twenties mm. and you've just come out, you just got your master's degree in, I don't know, the humanities or something, and you're watching this show. Would you be on number six's side? Um, they would probably be on number two side. That's what I'm thinking. And and, that's and the scary I, reality of, of of matters. I and that's one of the things that I was thinking when I was watching this episode. I'm uh, like, how you, does yeah. it re how does it resonate with audience younger audiences today? Uh, yeah, because I think um, uh, yeah, there's this, there's a scary element that would be number six is uh, a product of the system. He's he represents authority. He represents um, subversiveness. You know, he he represents. Uh, <laughs> he's transphobic. He's homophobic. He's racist. You know what I mean? He. Because he doesn't play his cards, he doesn't right. show everything. He's guarded. He he will be he would be branded everything. He he is not going to necessarily uh, uh speak up for whatever group you want him to speak up for. Yes, if somebody's getting attacked, if it doesn't necessarily meet his interests, he might not come to that person's aid. Or he However, would say, "You're you're you're trying to manipulate me through getting me to agree to whatever justice you want to be meted out." I'm well, not going to do that. He plenty of people th himself throughout the series. Yeah, and he's manipulated back, um, and he he out manipulates himself in one episode. <laughs> yes, he does. So, um, but 
you know, he does have a he does have a strong sense of morality, and uh, he does have a strong sense of justice as well. And those are met uh, when it comes to Hammer into Anvil. Uh, we, we see that we see that head on. That's that's a ruthless number six. That is a ruthless number six playing people like fucking fiddles. Yes. Out of necessity. Out of necessity, but it shows his skill set and it shows how good he is. And when he's doing that, he's doing it with the charisma and he's doing it with the smile. And uh, it, that's that's the absolute beauty of it. He uh, so he when he can, if he wants to play the game, he can play the goddamn game. Uh, but yeah, he's not going to be the you know he, number six isn't going to be the person that goes Black Lives Matter. Right. You know, he's he's not he's not going to be that person. He's just going to be sitting back and he's going to be assessing everything. He's just going to he's been getting on with himself. He's going to be seeing what's going on. You know who. Who are the legit people? Who are the manipulators? Who are the prisoners? Who are the wardens? He would be doing exactly that sort of thing. He's not. He's not going to be on Twitter, you know. <laughs> he's not going to be any of that sort of uh, superficial. This isn't a superficial character. Uh, well, he's also. I mean, the idea of fighting for individuality is the long game, you know. And 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 this this show shows that I, he it, over the course of the seventeen episodes. The idea of the the sovereignty of the individual is challenged in so many different ways, and and nowadays I think that individuality is something that I mean when I listen to people talk about collective or Marxist ideology, and people are describing themselves as Marxists, I'm like, did you pay attention to the 20th century? <laughs> like like did you see what happened in 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 Cambodia or did you see what happened in 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 Russia under Stalin? I, it's it's unbelievable that that nowadays people would rather be especially in America. Well, I want to join my collective. You know, I want to yeah. have this and I'm I, Come I, right I, this, Come right that. And I I think as a fan of the prisoner Maybe part of the reason I am a staunch believer in the individual is that I, I watched The Prisoner when I was like 12 for the first time. Mm. And, it, and, you know, I read Franz Kafka's The Trial, and I, I I love this kind of literature. And it's strange to me now how people, you know, I, I, I hear people bandy about the term like, well, I'm a Marxist. I'm like, really? Do you know what Marxism is? Why are you a Marxist? And, and, and it's... Uh, uh, it's, it's, I think this show, it's, it's going into watching it again is actually soothing my soul. Because the fight for the individual is is something I've always believed in. I mean, and, the, the irony is this: this should this should speak to every young person. Yes, this show it did this, to me. This, and this did should, to you. This should be your war cry. You know this this show. Um, and nowadays, you are kind of concerned <laughs> that that people who should be understanding that this person is all about your right to an individual. Um, and now we're just getting, like you say, we have this tribalism, we have this collective, we have this fucking uh, Marxist goddamn communist sort of attitude going on in so many different places at the moment. And it's not even nuanced. You know, the the the, no. spe the spectrum of, of, of individuality is what's so important. I mean, I constantly am talking about on my own show, I'm like, look, man, in the entire infinitude of the universe, the, the old thermodynamic miracle that uh, Matt, Dr. Manhattan talks about, there's only one of each of us. In the entirety of creation, in the whole of mm -hmm. human history, I mean, you might be a twin, sure, but each one of us is here for a finite amount of time, and we're all mm -hmm. we're each unique, and that is we're, the last thing you want to do is be lumped into a group where everybody's the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole point, you think, the whole you beauty. Think. <laughs> I, I, that's the thing. The whole beauty of the human race is each one of us is different, and that's and why yet. we're beautiful. Mm. And yet, and everybody's beliefs are a little bit different. Everybody likes food that's a little bit different. Everybody's experiences are different. But no, no, no. Today, you must believe what we all believe. And if you don't, you are out. You are You're gone. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you you have, I mean, even like with uh, Gina Carano yesterday, just the voice of reason. And oh, no, then... I didn't hear. What happened? I didn't hear what she, she said. Oh, um, I, think, I think she was defending George R.R. R. Martin. Um, uh, with with his with his mispronunciations and and whatnot, when you're not used to saying certain names, you're gonna mispronounce. It's not fucking racism. 
I mean, but, when you, you read know, a book, a science fiction book, you 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 or a fantasy novel, it's the Blopanokinis of the Kalapanis of the Empire, yeah, you, and and you, in your mind, you know who the character is, but you don't know how to say their name. I yeah, mean, yeah, it's just yeah, your your brain sort of makes up a name in your head, and then somebody comes along and says, "Yeah, Stig what Bocker Likalakalis," and you're like, "Oh, well, what's I so called strange? Him Stig in my head. I, I mean, that's a perfect example. Doesn't he deserve respect? I mean, George R. R. Martin has been writing. I've been reading George R. R. Martin books for forty years. I mean, he no, wrote do a you book... know why? Because we have those people at the end of this episode, right? <laughs> That's why we have these the people at the end of this episode being pointed in a direction. Go. That's why this show is the most important show today. <laughs> it's the most important show that probably will ever be in the world ever. And yet there are, there are people that would reject the message of this show that would not accept it. Um, let's jump back into the yeah. episode. When he's on the, the, the lovely little area outside overlooking the old folks' home and he's got the radio and number two comes up, unashamedly comes up with his observer, his handler. So number two then realizes that she's actually part of the system. She's watching him. But she doesn't, she herself, she isn't, she isn't like, how to put this? She's not a zombie of the village. No. She has, she has her own individual thought. However, her individual thought is assimilation within the village. We must all be assimilated with. I don't understand your resistance. Why are you resisting? This this is what it is. This is where it, this is what you need to be part of. No, yeah, I mean you're you're here. Why resist? Because you're not going anywhere. Mm. You know why you're we're not you're not leaving anytime soon. So why not just become part of this? And again, it's like just what we were talking about. You know, it's, it'll be much easier for you. If you just, you know, enjoy this place. Just take it for if what it is. If you just take the comics book pledge. That's to my, my people out there. They'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about taking, it's, you know, whatever indoctrination it is. Uh, you take, you you join this sorority. You know, you uh, follow this football team. You follow this political uh, party. It'll just be easy for you if you towed this line, if you said these things. If what, we put what, what? these... What's the problem with that? Come on, as you can do yeah, what, what they could tell possibly you to go do. wrong. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? And he, of course, is like, no, you know. And he he has an, a, a response to to every one uh, of her um, of her little answers. And then we have um, they take the radio off him. Of course, um, that's when he has the Dutton scene. Yep. Um, and this is where he writes out the letter and he puts it on the body. And then he's well, he he lets the body go with this. Letters saying I'm stuck on the island. Da, 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 da. That's when he turns back and Dutton's there and he has that conversation with Dutton. But I have to say, I, I kind of he should know better. Where does he think that how far away does he think that body's gonna make it? You know. Oh, uh, it, it's it's it's, it's kind of even it's I would say it's almost desperate. Yeah, it is. It is desperate. I I, I just I don't know if I like this plot point. I mean, I understand why because it sets up what happens, but I, I I always thought that come on man, <laughs> you know you know better. Yeah, yeah we we know we yeah. know, but but again, as an episode two, right? He's still establishing himself in the village. He's still trying to find out what he can get away with, what he can't get away with. Just exactly how much is watched, how much isn't watched, the the uh, repercussions of your actions, because this is about repercussions as well, right? Which he doesn't quite he doesn't quite understand that yet. No, because he has literally signed his own death warrant. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I said, that's that's what makes everything here such a clever manipulation. Is he thinks there's a possibility if this can come ashore, maybe it can float to a boat, a somewhere, right. <laughs> get picked up by something or other. Uh, and later on, we dis I mean, later on as the series develops, we realize every fucking boat around here belongs to the village. <laughs> yes. every, every aircraft belongs, you know. And he's not uh, wrong. The body does get picked up. It does get picked <laughs> up. Um, 
possibly by the boat from uh, Checkmate. Uh, possibly, possibly that boat. But uh, yeah, it does get picked up. But he dresses up for the uh, for the carnival. He goes to the carnival. Number two is uh, Peter Pan, uh, the the boy who never grew up. Which is interesting because uh, Mary Morris, like I said, is a very small, diminutive person, and she's also very um, o- almost uh, genderless. Right. Um, and so for her to play a male character as her character kind of feels right. It doesn't feel out of out of place. Well, and the literary allusion to the story of Peter Pan too is is it comes into play and the Lost Boys and yeah, yeah, all she's of looking, that, yeah, you know, all of that is is very, you know, that she's the leader of she's the leader of the Lost Boys. Yeah. Everybody in the village is a lost boy. Yeah, everyone's a lost boy, and uh, you know the the uh, the metaphor isn't exactly subtle because no. you know. I, I've been referencing his handler all through the the stream as Bo Peep. She dresses up as Bo Peep because right. she's the shepherd watching the sheep. Uh, she's got her sheep that she needs to look after, number thirty four, number six, whichever other numbers that she's looking after. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these aren't exactly, um, you know, you've got Queen Elizabeth the first, who's the maid, uh, Queen Elizabeth the first. Uh, she beheaded, you know, she she executed numerous people. Uh, we have Napoleon as the doctor, the dictator. And then we have, I think, Julius, meant to be Julius Caesar. Sure. Uh, for Aubrey Morris uh, as Julius Caesar um, as, they, as they come in. So, the, you know, he, again, he's the one who's lording over the citizens of the village by decree and all that sort of stuff. So they each have their... And I also like, you know, whenever you have costume parties, especially in this setting, it it, it it's injecting that element of surrealism mm. uh, that I think is important that plays out throughout the rest of the series. And I think in Arrival, it's pretty, it's pretty, I mean, Ro- I, I've always thought Rover brings an element of surrealism to the proceedings, but now this, this, the, the different, it, it's almost like all the different eras that are being represented, the different leaders and everything, it, everything it means in terms of history and, and how did governments work? You know, mm. you know, all of these things are brought up by these, by, by the characters they choose to portray. So immediately you could look at that as there's, there's commentary upon commentary upon commentary about leadership and governments that rise and fall. And uh, maybe I'm reading more into it than, than is there, but it seems to me that everything is always carefully thought up. McGowan thought all this out. Oh know. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he, he, he himself being just a tuxedo. Exactly. Everyone's in costume. He's in a tuxedo. Uh, he thinks it's because he's playing himself. Uh, and and there's a part of me which thinks, no, yeah, well, yes and no. You're playing yourself, but you're you're playing yourself. You're well, not I'll, yourself. You are I'll, playing yourself. Also, if he were to have picked a costume, that says something about him. That yeah, says oh, something yeah, about yeah, his yeah, internal yeah. life. So if he were to pick uh, your whatever character, oh, that means you admire so and so, which leads yeah, us to if believe he picked Churchill, if he picked uh, you know, something like that. Um, you know, if he picked somebody, then you would be able to sh- have him in the same category as everyone else. And being at a co- to- uh, the costume party by not wearing a costume, he's he's resisting. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it shows it shows all the resistances, uh, but of course, as we, you know, find out later on when they send the mob after him, um, th- when she says, "Well, they don't know you're dead. You're al- you're already dead. They just don't know it yet because his body is in the morgue." But we we'll get to that. Um, so they have a little bit of a dance and whatnot. He leaves uh, the party. Uh, that's when he comes across the. He he puts on a gown and a, some glasses. He's got a number. Uh, comes across the woman. He's just like, I got a kill order for Dutton. <laughs> you know, okay. Um, then he uh, goes down into the. Uh, it's like searching around the town hall because he wasn't allowed into the town hall earlier, which again figures in because in the next episode we'll do, which is free for all. He's in the town hall. Yeah. Uh, so this episode he wasn't allowed in he didn't know what the town hall was he had to get told so again it kind of continuity wise 
uh, it matters later on. You know, when he's at his house at one point, he says, I'm new here. Um, when he's referencing the doctor at one point, he says, I've seen your hospital. Of course, because <laughs> he had just seen the hospital in arrival with, with Cobb. Uh, and then he goes down into the the, the bowels of the uh, of the town hall, discovers the morgue, discovers the dead body that he put out to sea, and then number two and the cat uh, come into the room, uh, and then they put it all out there. You know, oh no, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. have I jumped the gun? Uh, a little bit. Because there's, there's, well, we're going to the, the the trial. Did he? Did he? No, he he didn't. Sorry, sorry, he didn't go into the bowels to the the mortuary yet. No, he just went and um, he got the kill order. Saw it was Dutton. Then does he go back to the uh, party? Well, yeah, I mean, he yes, I think uh, I think he does. Well, no, 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 because he goes down into the morgue. He finds out that Dutton's to be uh, executed, yeah. And then he he finds the body. He finds the body uh, that he floated out to sea was discovered, obviously. And um, the, the number two says this corpse. Oh is no, be that's right. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as, yeah, it's so, going to yeah. be altered to look like you. You know, yeah, we're going to alter this to look like you. And the outside the world thinks yeah. you're dead. Yeah, and then they take him back to the party. Then they have the trial, yeah. Uh, the 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 French trial, and again, it's it's kind of. I think that this number two is French, uh, uh, because there's a lot of kind of like referencing to 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 France in this, and um, there's a point in it where he says, "Are you British?" <laughs> right, and and she does have a very affected. When she speaks, it's all very old chum, old boy. Right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of almost a parody of of, of expressive, you know, OTT English. Yeah. Uh, and then they have the, the court where they have the maid, who's dressed up as, uh, I think, Queen is but the first. Uh, then they have Caesar, uh, or, which is uh, Aubrey. Then they have the doctor, who's um, Napoleon. They have uh, Bo Peep, who's the... Uh, prosecutor, and they have number two, who's the defender, even though this is pretty much determined. And they put him on trial for having the radio, which is a weird kind of thing to put him on trial for. For everything that's happened throughout the episode, it's the radio that they're putting him on trial for. But of course, everything's in the village is a it's a ruse, you know. It's a ruse, uh, uh, yeah, it's all ruse. And then, and then and Dutton's a part of that too. Yes, I, yeah, because they acute, they basically just immediately find him guilty. Yeah, but he's like he's like his mind is is not right, and he's the court jester, and it's oh, he's it's, he's it's like he's been a lobotomized. Yeah, he's he's yeah he's not he's not there anymore. Yeah, he's his mind's been taken from him. Everything everything that was in here has now been taken from him, uh, and and he was called as a character witness. And he's literally just like a drooling, uh, a drooling jester. He doesn't recognize number six he can't speak this is he is dead for all intents and purposes he is dead and th then they pass the sentence of death on number six number six just kind of walks through the crowd and then just when he gets towards the end of the room starts to run and then you just get the screams of everyone and this is this is the twitter mob this is the cancellation mob yep. cancellation mob's coming for you folks Cancellation time, and and and, just... and the the outcome of this trial was already it was already you know from the very beginning yeah. of the episode, it was inevitable. Like he yes. he 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 was going to get canceled. There was nothing he could do about it, and 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 this the this was this was it. Mm. This this, you know, was, he, this was always going to be the case. Yeah, I mean he's he is the dancer that is dead. I mean, and he's been yes. dancing the whole time. Yeah, he yeah he. Uh... He's trying so hard to hold on to his life, his old life, that he doesn't realize he's he's dead. His old life is dead. Yeah, and literally, uh, they're going to take this body, and and if, in case you didn't believe this, the world's going to believe it because this mm. this dead man is going to be you. Yeah. So no matter what you think up here, uh, no matter how much you try to resist, you're dead. You're gone. The world thinks you're over. 
your life is here with us. We've you know, cancelled you. Yeah, yeah. Every, we've cancelled you. Everything that you you have up here, we will take. It's just how we're going to take it, and we will indulge you for a while. But if you don't give it to us willingly, we will take it from you. Um, and when he's uh, hiding, I love the the end of this episode. Um, he's hiding in the room, and the uh, Bo Peep and Number Two come into the room, and he can see the Twitter mob outside, the cancellation mob outside. And she says, "Oh, don't worry, it's a one way mirror. They can't they can't see. You. They don't realize that you're already dead." Lying in his slab in the mortuary. But really, the Twitter mob don't even know where they're going or what they're doing. They've just been told to cancel. And then they lost their target. And now they're, they're, the target's gone now. So now they're sort of directless and meaningless. And you have to get the handler to usher them onto the next. You know, this is how you can put it into modern day. I, you know, but it's well, the same sort of theory. Well, I also love like you know there, there's the teletype machine too. Yes, and and it uh, apparently doesn't work. At well, first. he he it's it's to type it away. He rips the machine. He rips all the the wiring out to, to stop it. I think it's meant to be the machine that's churning out the orders, like the kill orders and stuff. Right. Like I mean, that. that's it, it's assumed that that's the communication. Yeah. This is the line of communication. And he, you know, like you said, he tears it. So it doesn't. He tears it up so he doesn't think it works anymore. You know. Yeah. And, and then, even that. Um, even that's a ruse. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I this is the surreal bit because I think that's actually this the surre- you know the the true surreal element of the show uh, because when he's when the handler's gone and number two is like she's no longer your handler because she actually tried to defend him at one point in the trial. Sure. Uh, and so again, it was she blurred the line herself she blurred her own lines so she's now no longer objective she can't she can't do that job anymore no and then uh number two is just like number six is just like well i'm, I'm gonna resist you at every turn and then she's just like well how very uncomfortable for you old chap, chap. <laughs> and then the teleprompter carries on going and to me it was saying you can try and rip out you know, you can try and tear things up. You can try and destroy things, but society, the fabric of society. I mean, this is just a thing. It's a, it's a machine. Yeah. You know, you can destroy all the machines you want, but but the ideas are still there. You know, yeah, you're you not, still keep ticking. Yeah, and the mobs right outside. So, you know, yeah, they just need to be point, pointed at you. That's all they need to do: is be pointed at you. Because next episode, who's after him in the village? Nope. Because they got, they got, you know, whatever. Because it's all directionless and meaningless. But you can but run for office. But you can run for office. Oh, but there's a and there's another beautiful linking line to next episode, because number two says to number six in this episode, "This is a democracy of sorts," <laughs> and it's just, it's just really, and it's like gr- that's great because next week we're going to see the democratic process uh, of the village. Um, so right, we've we've been through that. So let's open it up. Let's open it up to the floor now. Uh, let's see if we got uh, some people's uh, castionis and whatnot. Uh, let's go like through the. So there were some mm-hmm. good ones. There were some good ones. Uh, oh, good, 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 good. So first of all, we have uh, Shane O'Reilly uh, with a one uh, euro fifty super sticker of a phallic unicorn. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. <laughs> I get very upset if I don't get my phallic unicorn. <laughs> Uh, the rich, uh, Richard or the Richard with a five dollar super chat. You are both wicked cool together. Cheers to you and your mods. Uh, yes, I forgot to say thanks to my mods last night after the stream. I felt really bad. Uh, my mods are amazing. Uh, yes, yes, and thank you. Yeah, I, I, I love doing these with Richard, they are so much fun. I get so excited to do these. Um, I just love listening to your voice. Like when you said you were going to go into <laughs> acting, I'm like, you could have been the new Brian Blessed. <laughs> like, Gordon's alive. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, dude, uh, I love I Claudius. You know, after oh, yes, this, we yes. after this we should do I Claudius. I mean, I I oh. love I Claudius so much, and yeah. that's when I first fell in love with Brian Blessed, even before Flash Gordon. Mm. But but um, yeah, when I when I hear you, sometimes I'm like, oh, you got a Brian Blessed because I love him. <laughs> he was so oh, he's so great. good, so he was, good. He did something great the other day as well, didn't he? He's out. 
He was out giving it some longs uh, the other day. Yeah, he's a great, he's a wonderful man. Um, yeah. I just, I, yeah, I just remember as a kid. It's just such a such a loud man, you know. So good. The projection of him. It's just awesome. Not not it's a good impression, man. Uh, Eric O'Sullivan with twenty five dollar super chat. Thank you, sir. I'm so loving this. I'm forty seven years old. I knew this before Star Wars. Such an impact. Look at Twin Peaks. Lost the good place to mention a few. I feel that our prisoners' grandchildren. Uh, I appreciate the viewing order. Salente. Uh, you know, that's it's, an interesting one. It's interesting that he mentions The Good Place because that's something that, well, again, my girlfriend loves and I didn't really watch. But when I watched, started watching the episodes, I'm like, oh my God, this is totally the village. Like they're in, that was the thing that I, it didn't occur to me. I didn't realize that, but it mm. absolutely is, you know? Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, there's been, I mean, the Truman Show. Sure. You could, you know, that's that's essentially a very retarded American version of it. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it is an it is a version of uh, well, you know, it, it, playing playing with similar themes in a way. You know, America, small town America, part of our our national identity is living in your own village. You know, and oh, yeah, it, it's yeah, all yeah. it's always sort of whereas, you know, you live in Europe. You can get on a train and in an hour be in a different country with a whole different sure. history, with a different language. And America is so spread out, but we still cling like our voter. Uh, some of our, our half of our voters cling to this this bucolic way of Norman Rockwell, middle America, small town values. I mean, it's part of our national identity to live in our own little villages. And when our yeah. own little villages start to get, say, violated by different things we kind of go bananas and it's like let's build a wall you know we want to we some of us <laughs> would rather stay in the village than leave into the big world that's yes. why very, that's why 65 percent of americans don't have passports mm. and i mean that's that's it's it's there's something to be said for that and i'll, I'll tell yeah, you you know yeah um I, 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 I go to places sometimes when I go to conventions and things, and I go to uh, like I, I I am a big fan. I do love um, I do love Americans. Like I I'm somebody that do I I do love my country because not for any any reason of, of of necessarily nationalism, but one of the things I've always loved about Americans, at least I found in my life, is that like say you go somewhere, right, and somebody needs something done, like a person needs like I need you can help me build a fence. Americans will be the first people like, oh, I'll help you do that. You know, and they'll come over and they'll they'll build your fence for you. They'll help you yeah. build your fence. And and I think that there's something reassuring. That's why I don't quite understand a lot of what's going on in America now. Because if it, it, I, I always thought when Americans, you know, if there's something that needs to be done, like let's say we're gonna raise a barn, like in Amish territory, like in Witness, you know, the movie mm -hmm. Witness with Harrison Ford, Americans are pretty good at putting aside your differences and just helping your fellow neighbor out and making things. But on the other hand... Well, we I, all, I mean, all... I would argue that that's actually got more to do with um, urbanization than it has uh, anything else. Well, that's true. Um, it's because true. You're absolutely right I, there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a country boy uh, myself. I hate urban areas. I don't want to live in urban areas. I live... Uh, I look out that window. I just see uh, fields. You know, houses and some fields. I, I look at down there, fields are just rolling hills and fields. You know, it, it's it's idyllic. It's, it's, you know, one of those sort of like idyllic sort of places that you'd see on uh, TV. If if we start doing something here, like if I go outside and I see my elderly neighbor do something, I'll say, you know, David, David do, you, do you want a hand? You know, that that's the kind of mentality that we have here. Oh, uh, as is out, uh, I'll deliver his post to... Uh, you know, someone else, his neighbor around the corner, because they'll take it in for him. You know, it, 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 there's a, a very, uh, even my postman, it's just like, hey, do you want me to sign these for you and leave them on your doorstep while you, you know, put your fucking knickers on? Uh, yeah, yeah, cheers. Sort of thing. So, you know, it, every, every, everyone is, it's so polite. It's, it's, it's how kind of societies really should be run in as much as we're not, as, as a species, we're not 
cut out for urbanization for, for lengthy periods of time. This is not how our species have, has evolved. Our species has evolved through multiple small communities uh, that interact uh, and link with other communities through barter and trade. Uh, and that's how, how we, we uh, truly operate. This urbanization business, this is this is this is the rats, this is the rat trap. Uh, well, this is what what drives a lot of people stir crazy, the concrete jungle. But it, um, it, it's interesting you say that because because really the the whole idea of spies and spy craft are that's all products of urbanization. Mm. you know as as and 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 uh, when we think about culture and we think about, um, civilization. I think the the more urban we get, supposedly in our own minds, the better off. Like we're, we we have these giant skyscrapers and and these places of commerce and all that. But like you said, the day to day existence uh, it becomes very difficult. Like you, you, here in LA, the joke is you don't you might live next to somebody for five years and never speak to them. Yeah, you know you don't yeah. know who your neighbors are. And I found that to very much be true. And, and the way we, we drive from place to place, you spend sometimes hours a day in your car going from your work to coming home and you have your own little cocoon. And, and yet the one thing the village has going for it is, like you said, it's this bucolic, small environment. Like, and number mm. two says, just, just accept it. Your, your handler, you know, you can, what, what, why make it difficult on yourself? Who cares? You know, maybe we'll let you go. Conspicuous. A very conspicuous place. Yes, it and is. This, this is this is where you get the, the twist on the everyday neighbor. This is where you get t the twist on that friendly environment because this isn't a friendly environment. No, and Whereas I, I, in, I, in reality, it, it would be a much more. It would be a much more. Um, well, what what I was going to lead up to about the the America now is we're torn in two. You know, yeah. like you said, we we are we are a nation of people that. You are, you're either an urban dweller or or somebody like, a, let's say, democratic. You know, our big urban centers are are more democratic. You go more into the rural, small town, traditional America. They they tend to vote Republican. And and how do you get those two? Is there is there a way? Like, is there a way to to from a from an identity standpoint, if you come from a urban life if you come from a, a life of espionage and traveling the globe you're, it's not like you're traveling the globe going from small town to small town you're not you're going into these big urban centers the 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 center of all of this of, of global commerce and all that that's where you're working and yet that's mm. a whole different, that's a whole different world than most but, live in uh, nuance used to exist once upon a time and with the rise of social media, with your Facebooks and your Twitters and your whatnot, they very specifically are designed to fracture. Yes. Uh, they are very much designed to um, divide and to cause argument. Uh, that's what they're designed for. And so uh, when people have been participating in that sort of uh, activity for uh, such a, a, a long period of time, it starts to filter into everyday life. Everyday life becomes a fracture. Everyday life becomes a pick a side. Uh, I like tomatoes. Fuck you. I love fucking carrots. You know. Yeah, and it, it's, well, a, it's a vegetable for God's sake. I, I mean, here in America, you are you're, you're on social media. You might be like I, I've lived in L.A., but a lot of the people I talk to don't live in huge cities, or they live in mm. smaller cities. They live in, in in smaller communities, and yet we're, we're we all talk to each other as if we expect each other to completely be understand each other's existence utterly and that just simply isn't true no. you know and and yet we're trying to expect that it would be true and yeah, because social media uh lifts um i would say a weak-willed person's own self-importance yes, uh, yes it does. and and so uh, when you have a person who is 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 uh not so much uh clued into the ego uh you they start to believe it. They start to believe their own hype. They start to believe their own clicks, their own retweets, their own likes, uh, and they get this this sense of self importance. Which, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but <laughs> you, you, you're fucking nobody at the end of the day. All right, you don't bring anything to the table. 
Uh, whereas before we we just had everyday existence. Yeah. Um, now we 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 have you know fucking you just have to go to Twitter. You just have to. You don't even have to throw a stone uh, to come across a million dumbasses saying a million dumbass things, and then a million dumbasses more liking or retweeting or joining in on that that party, causing causing all manner of. And that's when you get Gina Carano coming in with with a voice of reason, and then you get the people from the end of Dance of the Dead. Ah! Right, right. After well, I, I, again, you know, the, it's a really interesting thing because, you know, I was following the Hugo. For people who don't know what we're talking about, they gave out the Hugo Awards this weekend, hmm. and George R. R. Martin was the master of ceremonies. And a lot of people said that he droned on and on, and he talked about people like John W. Campbell, the John W. Campbell Award, who he's somebody who got canceled a long time ago. You know, he's not the greatest person in the world and all this. But as an editor, he did do... I, I mean, the funny thing that I, I, I find strange about the world that we live in is if you're somebody who's done a lot of great work, whether it's mm -hmm. you're a writer, you're a filmmaker, whatever you've done, you could have done a lot of great work, and then the work exists. The work stands on its own. And then if you've done something, maybe something that happened later in life, maybe it's revealed that you're not as, or whatever, that not only are you gone, but the work that you've done is also gone. And I'm like, but work should stand on its own. You know, and I, I, I know it's harder depending on the right church from the state yes but uh, some things are so egregious that it's you can't but it, i i get that but it's so it's so quick that nowadays people revel in that and i'm like boy you know especially when it comes to films so many people work on movies so mm -hmm. many people brought their a-game to make this film and if the director turns out to be a douchebag or something does that invalidate all the work that all those other talented people did but uh, but unfortunately we we could have a logical argument about this we could have a logical debate about this and, and discussion and we could talk multiple things through right as reasonable human beings but the people who are doing this are not reasonable human beings you That's know true. why will, do you they think will, they will cancel somebody for one thing but if a same person on their side is doing exactly the same. Eh. So, so there's a vast level of hypocrisy onto it. Again, it's point and click. It's point and click destruction now, and it's become a sport. Yes, it, it has. It, it's, it's become. It, it, we're, we're doing modern day witch trials uh, on social media. Daily. Because people, uh, Daily. And particularly with COVID, and particularly with being locked at home, people are getting extra special crazy um, recently. <laughs> Uh, that, that makes them just really want to go for everything and anything that they could possibly get their, their hands on. Uh, but unfortunately, it's always been there. It's just now having a, an extra light shone on it. And so when other people come, oh, yeah, I, I could join in this, I can join in that. Again, you get your screaming, your screaming, go get them that we got at the end of uh, Dance of the Dead. And and it's it's interesting because uh, it really did feel that way, you know the the with the the surreal nature and the idea of this 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 costume party and the the, the people in the village, uh, it 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 does take on this absurdist surreal quality, and yet every single day that mob that was at Dance of the Dead could come for us, each yeah. one of us. Yeah, I mean uh, that's the first cancellation of number six. He gets cancelled. In a change of mind, uh, in another episode, um, but it's like, yeah, just as as prevalent today uh, as 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 back in sixty seven. You just have to change the words. Uh, sorry, well, you just have to change, you know, the reflect of what it reflects to, to correspond to to modern day and bingo, sure. jingo. You've got you've got exactly you've got exactly that. And and it's about canceling the individual, you know, a staunch yeah. individual to standing up for his or her personal rights and his his ability or her ability to to protect their sovereign individuality we're going to mm. come for you yeah um I, I i yeah i get very confused about when i say confused i mean confused in a i can't believe that you're so stupid uh kind of a way because um my philosophy is stop putting people on pedestals uh treat people like people regardless of color, creed, uh, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, etc., Just treat them like a person. Talk to them like a person. Treat them like a person. 
if that person is kind, if that person is good, then treat them accordingly. If that person is a dick, if that person is an idiot, uh, then treat them accordingly. Sure. And it doesn't matter what paintbrush they're tarred with, you know, black, white, yellow, purple, magenta, burnt sienna, whatever color you are, whichever gender, race, burnt sienna is always a good color. It's a great color. I loved it with gouache when I was gouache painting once, but once upon a time, loved it. Uh, but but you try and use that philosophy today, and you're an istophobianism, and it's like you do know that by putting them on a pedestal, putting people above others, by elevating, you are doing exactly what you're preaching shouldn't happen. Don't get it. Don't get it. We want equality through superiority. It's... They don't equate. It's not an equal... <laughs> no, you're. I know. Uh, but there we go. This and th that that's that's where we are with a lot of stuff nowadays. Um and you lose uh with, with the prisoner here, we have somebody who is an individual maintaining their individuality that was placed in a mob mentality. And they come at him from every different way as and we they, will explore. Yeah, and they will they will continue and they will not relent. Uh, Otaku Smurf uh, with a five dollar super chat. I believe it was in Change of Mind, uh, where the girl said that she outranked the number two in that episode. Mm. Uh, was that uh, the doctor, the female doctor? Um, she had she certainly had a massive air authority. I'd have to listen, I'd have to watch it back to see if there's an yeah. actual line uh, that says that, but. It felt like she was certainly getting directions to direct for uh, orders directly for number one, as a, as opposed to letting number two sort of uh, boss around. Uh, but number number six plays plays a great trick on her, um, which is good. <laughs> six, you know, you want your drugs here? Fucking hell. <laughs> um, uh, Marcone cliche uh, with a ten dollar super chat. I like my dream. A favorite quote of mine, very fitting in today's world. Sometimes I'm content with the rest of the world thinking I'm mad. I like my dream. Screw them. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's a, an individualistic uh, statement. I like my dream. I, my. It's individual. That's individualism. Right there, sir. Uh, Bill Lumberg with a five Canadian. Hey, as next Friday night tights is Hawaiian shirt day. No, it's not. So if you want, you can go <laughs> ahead and wear Hawaiian shirt and jeans. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. No, no. Uh, Bunyan Snipe with a two pound super chat. Number one is John Drake, and number six is his clone. Uh, no, but uh, we can discuss this. <laughs> uh, number, si uh, number six is John Drake. Uh, number one is metaphorical. Right. <laughs> no, the cloning technology doesn't exist yet. It's not. Uh, no, number number one it represents your alter ego. It represents your uh, everything that you are diametrically opposed to. Um, that is number one. So in number six's case, he was somebody who uh, massively held on to his individuality. Uh, number one had the village had the village she was has, about spoiler alert come on man spoiler oh alert. spoiler alert for 53 yeah yeah but uh no it's cuz it's clever cuz i mean it, it, it doesn't in any way impact the show right. because uh number 1 is always you're never going to get you're never going to get an answer to who is number 1 that is going to appease you Never. It's never going to happen because you can't just put anybody there. You can't put somebody that's been there. You can't technically have number six as number one. So number one always would have to be a construct. And was. So I don't have any problem with the the, the, the construct of number one. Maybe the idea of how they, you know... 
did it, not so much. But... Right. I mean, it's yes, the execution, <laughs> yeah, is maddening, but fun. But McEwen was mad. <laughs> he was pretty much mad by then, anyway. Yeah. I think, it, I think it had a breakdown. He was on the verge, or if not, working through a breakdown. Um, but that's what you you know when you're doing something that's so psychologically heavy. And literally taken on every responsibility almost by the end of the show. Then, yeah, poor Liam McKern. He had <laughs> bless his heart. Um, Destiny's captain uh, with a five dollar suture. I've loved this show since I was a kid in the seventies, but something I'd forgotten was how unpolished the editing is. It's been very rough rewatching. Um. Well, I you know, the editing of the show. Yeah, I mean, especially like in Arrival, they use a lot of jump cuts. You know, mm -hmm. there, there was, uh, there's, Close it, it was zoomings. Yeah, it was, it was part of the the style. I mean, back then, the the like I pointed out, Peter Hunt, who uh, directed Honor Majesty's Secret Service in '69, he yeah. was the editor of the Bond franchise, and he uses a lot of edits and things like that. I mean, yes, some of it's a little extreme. And it doesn't it doesn't flow. I think what that person's responding to is the fact that it's jarring. And it's I think meant in to a be way jarring. By You're never design. meant to be comfortable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think uh, Dance of the Dead particularly is one of the most beautifully uh directed and edited episodes. Uh there is. There's some unbelievable shots in this yeah. episode. Yeah, it's really good. Um yeah, it's 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 I think this is a phenomenally edited, phenomenally uh, phenomenally directed uh episode of the series but yes uh quite a bit of it is purposely meant to be jarring it's purposely meant to be disorientating um because that is the nature of the village and and normally the nature of the circumstance that uh number six is in yeah um jay Borf one with a ten dollar super chat hail uh got here late uh we'll watch after just showing support for this great series thank you uh, Rover, <laughs> yeah, and it is this that it is that Rover. It's got an image of uh, the <laughs> ball uh, with a five dollar super chat. Number two's true identity is the willingness to compromise. That's an interesting. I really like that. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I think there's uh, there's something to be said there. Um, yeah, it, it's hmm. it's. Because each number two brings something different. Uh, each number two is trying to to get well, not each, but you know, for the most part, sure. Uh, number two is trying to compromise somehow with number six. Uh, quid pro quo, but he's never going to get his. <laughs> you know, because it's always going to turn out to be you play with us. You can have a nice life here. Yeah, that's the best. That's the best they're ever going to be able to to really offer. Um, but I do like I do like the the willingness to. I don't know if it's as um... <laughs> I don't know if it's as comparable as that to be honest with you because I think I think number two is a bit more um, uh, proactive. So it's it's not necessarily the uh willingness to compromise. Um it's the desire to to assimilate, really. Yeah, and be and be a part of be a part of the the collective, like mm. the, the collective good. Like, oh come on, don't you want to just help everybody else out? Come don't on. Don't you just want to be part of the society? Yeah, come on, come on over here. Be a part of the fabric. Mm. Yeah, be, yeah, be part of the fabric. You be can the fabric. run a shop. You can, yeah, uh, you know, be a postman. You can be part of the system. Come on, be part of the system. Uh, no, said number six, sir. No, sir, I will not be part of the system. Uh, Mark C with a ten dollar super chat. So, as an allegory for today, few reject the message of individualism. But many will still choose the collective out of spite because they've been conditioned to hate one man by that collective. What do you think about that one? I, you know, who, who might that one man be? Um, the I, I, I think I think. Look, I think the problem is that 
we have a disconnect. Uh, it's not about hating one man. It's about wanting one man to be great. And, and I think that, you know, we, we live in a world where, look, I'm a fan of Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he did, was he a complex person? Sure. Was he an imperfect person? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But he, despite all of that, he rallied a country yeah. that was in a position not great. And without, without somebody, without a leader, with that kind of intellect, with that kind of wherewithal, uh, with, I mean, Britain would have been lost to the blitzkrieg mm -hmm. or or any number of things and and i think when you have a man the, the problem is you've got to have a man like winston churchill who is smart who is cunning who is understanding of politics i have a, i have no He's problem unbending unbending, unbending I have, and un, yeah i have no problem getting behind people who are who, who look to complete tasks i mean the idea of directing movies and all that you have to have a strong leader and, and I think that's what we're looking for. But that leader has to be up to the task. You know, they have to be the kind of person that can lead. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that that's, that's what's important. And I think, look, I think people like, human beings like to follow somebody who is smart and knowledgeable and thinks that they can take them well to the promised land. You know, and 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 why not? Because we all want to get to the promised land where we can we can we can be individuals. Mm -hmm. the, the real the real point is is that I think a lot of people have forgotten, especially in America, what makes a person worth following. And and I think that's the big difference. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm going to I'm going to play the devil's advocate card. I'm playing the devil's advocate card. Um. And I would say there will be people that will have exactly the reflect image of you uh, right there. And they will say sure. uh, that the, like, I know we're talking about Trump. Um, but <laughs> he's a dude, has a he had a TV show, fired, you know, fired a few people. Um, they would say, this person is doing this. We're now getting a contrarian government, uh, a contrarian uh, political party that will do everything that they possibly can to 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 cr try and curtail and to try and cut them off simply out of spite, simply out of a gotcha, simply out of a told you so. And I, 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 I don't agree. By the way, I agree. Say, I agree with that, though. I yeah, agree with I, what I, you just yeah, said. Yeah, I, I think there's uh, there's truth on both sides. I don't have any particular. I'm British. I don't have any particular love for for any of the parties. Uh, to be honest with you, I thought the last election, I thought America was fucked either way. Um, you know, do you, do you choose that? Per, do you choose which, which evil do you choose? One uh, has a has a has a prettier political platform and has uh, more experience, but we're seeing the evils of that. Uh, we've we've been seeing those for for a lot of years, and and the way it's been brushed over, and the way it's been uh, hidden, and now not so hidden. Uh, and then you've got somebody else. So that's all, you know. So you can't black and white this, is what I'm trying to say. No, not, there is, not there at is all. There's so much gray everywhere. And uh, we kind of, there are so many people who are not, uh, at least, even if they don't have an understanding, because I'm not going to be so arrogant, so I understand everything. I, I understand virtually none of it. Uh, but you you can't be that arrogant to say uh, at least acknowledge the the senses of gray. You got too many people that are that are just like one way or another, and that's my cast iron. That's it done. You can't sway me. You can't you can't change me. You can't bend me. You can't break me. Which is absurd, absurd yeah. and wrong. By the way, yes, but. You cannot get through to that person. So you can't have, with that person, a, a reasoned discussion. That's when... Ah! That's when you get that. Because then it does become a, a tribalistic uh, attitude. It becomes my team versus your team. It becomes uh, red versus blue, black versus white, you know. Uh, Liverpool versus Everton. Uh, that's when it becomes that sort of sort of just base tribalistic uh, mentality. 
but that's also not th that doesn't work either because you know people aren't no. thinking then there's there's <laughs> it no it doesn't work at all no it, it doesn't and 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 i think that like like for me you know i grew up being a fanatical star trek fan we've even lost as the a, middle the whole it, middle's gone we've got extremes it, it's gone. but but you know star trek star trek is a show <laughs> it's an elitist show Mm -hmm. It's about it's about elites. It's about the best of the best. best it's about the, the top 99th percentile. If you're not part of that 99th, it, well, pardon me, it used to be that way. And and Kirk, Spock, and McCoy might be three sides of the of the the the, the, the triumvirate there, the mm -hmm. id, the ego, the super ego. But they're at the 99th percentile. Yeah, Star Trek Discovery is about a show of people that aren't. You know that, no, that's that stupid. There, yeah, there, and and it's like a show of today. Like, hey, you know, I mean, we we, I, you should just come be a part of this, and you know, and, and part of the reason that that I don't like that show is it's 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 a show where every episode is about people's incompetence, except mm -hmm. their their magical leader who has magical powers that can make everything all better. That's and, because it's written by people that don't have intelligence, and it's written by people who don't understand nuance, and it's uh, written by people who, again, can't see the gray. They can only see the black and the white. I'll take that back. Can only see the black or the but, white. But, you know, you take it back to The Prisoner, and Patrick McGowan, the, well, let's, I mean, the character of number six, uh, even though he's not infallible and certainly not perfect he isn't going to put up with any of this nonsense no. I, I i mean the 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 village and the world around him is constantly shifting what it's trying to do it, it, it wants the same thing you must conform you must bend to our will and and every week it's somebody new saying bend to my will you must join the group even mm -hmm. though the leaders are changing there's no one leader no, nope. it's not a battle of wills between number six and and one individual. No, nope. it's the system. You know, this system that come join our collective, come be a part of this, give up who you are. Why not just come 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 over here and come be in the village? And he will not. You nope. know, and 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 it seems like every day we have a new number two. Every day there's somebody up stepping up to that plate, telling us what we should think and what we should believe, and you need to be Absolutely. a part of this. Absolutely, and, and and the the number two is just same shit, different day, you know. And uh, it, it's amazing to me that nowadays uh, we live in a world full of number twos, and we and we have a a, a a new a network new system that is number two. Yes, absolutely, and it's very very uh, uh, frustrating. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if it's Fox or CNN. It's number two. It's number two, and it's propagandist, and that's what it. it and that's what it is. There is uh, again the the center is is gone. The center is lost uh, at the moment uh, because there is too much um, extremism with with uh, black and white. There's and it was the shades of gray which binded us. You can't get gray without black and white together. No, and and that that's those shades of gray. That nuance is where the individual lives. Yes, you know we 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 are not one side or the other, and that's what the the true individual is a mix of these things. You know, we're we're and we have some of this and more of that, and and all of us have different ingredients, and that's what makes us all you know for the most yeah, part because interesting. If, to use a political analogy, number two could be. Republican or Democrat, you could have one number two offer assimilation into the village with people. You could have another number two offer power over others, and it's it is that we do see that. So it doesn't. There's no political side, you know. It's always as if uh, the prisoner represents the 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 middle represents the, uh, the the centrist, the the person that won't be swayed one way or another, that will maintain their individuality and will weigh up their own options for themselves, as opposed to taking those various carrots which are being dangled. But it's interesting that it's number six, it's his very presence that causes the 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 number twos of the world to to come into to, to a call to action.
Does you know if, you're not, does your existence not call that right now? That's that's it. I mean, <clears throat> we all then it's our obligation. We must be mm. number sixes, all of us. Yeah, you know because the fact that we will not bend to certain totalitarian thoughts or ideas, or we must more so than ever before. I think certainly in my lifetime, I've never seen a world like this. And I'm sure it was brought about because of social media. It's really risen up. <laughs> it's it's smartphones that it really began. You know, what 2007 when the iPhone was introduced and mm. other smartphones came into it. That, that, that you're carrying these supercomputers that you can talk to anybody across the planet, and and more importantly, listen to their ideology. <laughs> and you can program your phone to only get one ideology. Sure. I mean, this this was this was something that 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 really has occurred. And so we all, I think, are obligated to resist. To Absolutely, resist number two. Absolutely, number six is is like I said. This is this isn't a character that you would per se like, uh, but this is a character that you should support. Yeah, we admire and support them. You don't have to like mm. them. Yeah, exactly, and that, uh, that's that is it, exceptionally important. Um. Oh, that was a. Oh, I did enjoy that one. Uh, thanks, Mark. That got a that got a right nice little discussion, didn't it? Uh, Mark Grandpappy, C is a good man. Yeah, yeah, he is a good man. Yes. Uh, Grandpappy Fisk with a five dollar super chat. The best shows come from the sixties. Prisoner, Star Trek, Doctor Who. Sixties uh, was. I mean, I wasn't around in the sixties, but the sixties was an era of change, of massive change, um, and it is change which is. Wow, it is felt even you know in today's society. Um, you also had people creating shows that were pragmatists. They came out of World War II. They saw the rise sure. of the middle class. Um, we we've lived in a very coddled, privileged oh, existence. We, without <laughs> doubt, still do. We have still no idea. Did. You know, mm -hmm. we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're all locked at home. Oh my God, it's so hard. It's oh, so hard. I'm in the middle of my pandemic here. You yeah. Know? <laughs> How are you doing, Robert? And how's LA, Robert? Is yeah, it okay? You know, it's fantastic, right. as you know. Sorry, I'm just sending a tweet, mate. I'll be with you in a sec. <laughs> Global pandemics, you zombie apocalypse, people for the you know for the first world. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. <laughs> but that's just it. We got we got so many creature comforts now. It's uh, it's unreal. Um, well, it's, it, that's why we, we, all we have left. I mean, the bread and circus is now. We don't actually have to go fight in the arenas. We get to just sit at home behind our desks and our keyboards, and we can argue and scream at people. Hell, we can cancel sure. somebody and ruin their lives just by a tweet. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but what is interesting, what I do find interesting about the tweet is uh, the prisoner is all but forgotten at the moment, and Star Trek and Doctor Who are burning on in on in flames right now. Off the shoulder of Orion. <laughs> I wish it was so poetic. I really do. Hey, come um, on. Lower deck starts tomorrow. Woohoo. I know. I should I should laugh at the absurdity if I wasn't ra seething with rage on the inside. At how look how they massacred my boy. I know. I'm gonna blame some of these people. If my, he should they, get struck well, by lightning. Uh, they they put um an, a, a little trailer for uh, for the show starting up on Twitter just before the show started, and uh, it was um they were sat in their quarters and and one of them was saying to the other, one of them was making noises and like, what are you doing? Oh, I, I like to make warp noises when I do this. That's not a warp noise. Yeah, this is an Enterprise D reference. Do you get it? Uh, warp four noise, and then they just start going, and everyone just starts doing noises. That's the joke. Yeah, you know what's really funny? The seven not lower the, decks. No, the the lower decks episode of Next Generation. Well, that's it's not such, funny at it, all. <laughs> it's such, uh, I, I mean, it's the exact opposite, and it has such a it packs such a wallop. It's you know, uh, it's a real. Well, it has a really hard ending. 
Um, but it's it's about redemption, you know. I mean, that's about redemption. Um, because it, it has the girl from the episode with Wesley Crusher where they uh the, the guy died in the um the Nova, you know, the sort yeah, of the cold with Starburst. Uh with which had uh Tom Paris, but not Tom Paris. But not yeah. Because then they'd have to pay the writers of that. Because then they'd have to pay the writer, yeah. Uh, yeah. Royalty. We like the yeah. actor. Let's bring back yeah. Robert Duncan. But that is Tom Paris, and it's got Tom Paris's backstory. Well, he's not called Tom Paris in this one, though. Um, but yeah, that is a it's a very sad episode, and it ends, I think, with just Picard sat at his desk in silence. And uh... but now, uh, bless shield, bless shield, bless shield. Yeah, all right. I got a bat lift. Remember a bat lift? Oh man, let me stab you with it. I'm drunk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stab you. It's Romulan whiskey. It's blue. Yeah. Did you get it? <laughs> you saw it once. Are you laughing? I just can't get over the difference between whiskey and ale. I don't know. Uh, Robin and Ale's green, <laughs> Robin and Whiskey's blue. That's that's the only difference I know. Oh God, fucking hell! Oh my God. Um, yeah, I'll I'll have to VPN it and uh, <laughs> make sixty eight videos about how horrible. How? how... <laughs> I'm looking Sorry. forward to making videos about it. How can you go from? How can it? How can we regress so bad, Robert? I don't know. Maybe this is just we're 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 the we're being sucked in before the next big bang and our 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 next stage of our evolution. Well, it can't suck any harder than it is. <laughs> uh, Chris Brown with the ten dollar super show, just a great show as. Thank you, sir. Robert is quite an integral part of that. <laughs> <laughs> that but it's your idea. <laughs> what? Takes two to tango, sir. That's true. That's true. Takes two to tango. Uh, Eskimo Nofono with a $5 suit chat. Off topic, so you can skip. Nah, we're here. We're coming up to the end now. We we said two hours, and, and that's it. Uh, really enjoying the Ghost of Tsushima playthrough. Oh, God, it's so good. Oh, I Hail, can't wait uh, to play that game. Oh, it's so good. I've just done something in the game today, and I literally, like, squeed. Well, I didn't squeed. I screamed like a man because it was that good. Oh I yeah, you want. but it was just like, God, this is one of the greatest things I've ever done in the game. Uh, really enjoy your Ghost of Tsushima playthrough. Hail RMB as well. Get your rest as hail mods. Uh, night, love you so much. Love you so much. Uh, thank you, Eskimo no Fono. Uh, do we have any more? We got one more, and it's here. I'll grab it here. Uh, Dream Morph one with a five dollar super chat. I hate to go off topic. But I ask your opinions. Oh, but I ask your opinions on Umbrella Academy season two. Uh, Jay Moore, one. Uh, if you um, are a member of my channel, any level from a dollar a month level, uh, you can catch all my uh, streams, uh, VODs there. Yesterday, when I did bagging, boarding, and, and chatting with Gary, the real BBC, uh, we discussed a bit of uh, Umbrella Academy season two. But since. Uh, you're here just very quickly. Have you seen it yet? Robert? I've only watched the first two episodes, but I'm loving it. And I, I love the first season and I love the characters. So I'm mm. I'm I'm expecting great things for the rest of the season. Are you gonna tell emotional? Okay. Um Oh um, no, really? Mm. Well, there's the boys stuff. season two, and that looks pretty bananas. <laughs> there's some good stuff. <laughs> All right. That's the good stuff. Okay. Did you like the first season? I loved the first season. Of okay. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. And uh, uh, I will say, uh, it doesn't ruin anything. I will say that um, that kid that plays five, he is the show. Oh, dude. Yeah. He is, he is the show. He He's an amazing actor. Unreal. He's his... He has chemistry with absolutely everyone. His presence is phenomenal. His acting talent is incredible. And he's 16 years old. Sunshine, and I don't mean that in a patronizing way. You're going to be massive, mate. And, and it will be on talent. 
Um, yeah, but to me, I mean, I, I, uh, I, yeah. Enjoy. I uh, yes, I'm. I'm looking forward to what you know. So much. I can't, good say, I can't say any more of that because uh, I don't want to ruin anything for, uh, yeah, for yeah. Robert. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's wrap it up then, Robert, because that is that is the two hour mark. Ding. Uh so in so in closing, um, where do you kind of rate? I know this is a bit of a wishy washy, but where do you kind of like rate Dance of the Dead in, in the scale of the prisoner? Oh, I think it's a great episode. And mm. um, you know, I think it's it's in the higher echelons of of the show. I mean, I really do. I think it has a lot of scope, it has mm -hmm. a lot of themes, it has uh the plot is very it's very, it's a mind bending, twisty, mm. intriguing plot that adds whole new layers to everything. Um, I'm, I, I love this episode. Mm. I agree. I think this is up there, uh, certainly up there in the, in the best of the episodes. Mm. Um, it, it really connects to Arrival. Um, it, it, it again sets down the rules of the village, some more rules of the village, uh, some of the more uncomfortable rules of the village. Uh, which is great for for future episodes, um, and it yeah I, I uh, when you've got such a great number two, you know the number two character is so important to the show yeah so important you can't have a weak number two, and you can feel it when there's a slightly weaker number two number two has got to be on parity with number six yeah uh, and 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 Mary Morris was just like boom yeah all she crushed it. it all of it yeah. And uh, so, are we in agreement that next week, free for all? 100%. Cannot wait. Another favorite yes. of mine. God, that was a great episode. Great episode. Uh, so, your homework, folks. Next week, we're on Robert's channel. Next Wednesday, we're on Robert's channel, 12 Pacific, uh, 8 uh, G British summertime, actually, here in the UK. Uh, and your homework is free for all. Free for all. And if you, if you don't know, um, I should say, I should mention my channel on YouTube is called The Burnett Work after my name. Yes. Uh, so find me there. Subscribe, like, all that kind of thing. And you should subscribe and like to this show because this show is awesome. <laughs> this show is this show is every single solitary bit of it. Uh, Dude, this is yeah. our third show. Yeah. We've done six hours of The Prisoner. Yeah. We're going to end up doing 34 hours of The Prisoner. How amazing is that? <laughs> It's, so good. it's fantastic. Could have got thing is that you could have gone on and on and on. This is the, the beauty yeah. of it. Uh, so huge thank you to everyone who stopped by today. Uh, massive thank you, uh, to everyone who oh, hold on, we've got a quick rover at the last minute. Uh, rover with a five dollar super chat. Do either of you have the prisoner Jack Kirby Jill Kane art edition? No, but Gary I don't either. from Nerd Roddick does. Yeah, I do not, and I, I want to get it. Mm, I, I am on the lookout. But um, one hasn't come up. Yeah. Uh, but Gary from Nerd Roddick does the bastard. He's got all the nice toys. Yeah. Um. Uh, so yeah, big thank you to mods. Uh, biggest thank you, of course. Oh, to Robert uh, Shane O'Reilly sneaking in with a quick two euro super chat. Uh, I really, uh, I really, sorry, I really enjoy a good solid number two. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all don't we all <laughs> cleans the pipes? Sir. Yes, it does. Cleans the plumbing and all that. Um, so Robert, yeah, massive thank you again. Uh, thank we'll you, be on your channel next week, yeah, uh, which I'll be sure to to plug here as, as always. And Can't wait, as we should end every show, I think it's only apt that we say, We're seeing you, we're seeing you.